Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor, founder, Grand Poobah, and Imperial Wizard of the Crux Catholic Media Empire. Welcome to Last Week in the Church, the show where we are relentlessly devoted to serving up stale news about the Vatican and the Catholic Church you've already heard. Speaking of stale news, how about this? POTUS was in the house this week. U.S. President Joe Biden came calling on Pope Francis. Now, if you are an American Catholic who at all pays attention to church affairs, you are already well aware. You've already read all the news and consumed all the commentary, but that is not going to stop us from squeezing every last ounce of juice out of this lemon. We will begin with the actual substance of the exchange between President Biden and Pope Francis. That is, what did the two leaders actually talk about, so far as we know? Then we've got three interesting bits of subtext and color surrounding the meeting to go over. One that happened before, a sort of mini tempest about exactly what would the Vatican be showing us about this historic meeting. Then two things afterwards, both of them involving President Biden and the issue of receiving communion. One, something the president said, the other, something the president did. Then we are going to close with three, or two rather, bits of perspective about what to make of all of this in an effort to put it all in its proper context. That's what's waiting for you this week on Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. Happy Monday to you. Uh, Happy All Saints Day. Today actually is All Saints on the Church's liturgical calendar, or as it's known here in Italy, Ogni Santi, every saint. The, The feast of Ogni Santi here is a national holiday, and I don't mean like one of these nominal fake national holidays, like, say, Columbus Day in the States, where You know, I don't know, maybe kids wear special costumes to schools or grocery stores have sales, but otherwise, life goes on as normal. No, here, absolutely everything comes grinding to a halt. Actually, it's part of what the Italians call un ponte, a bridge. They started their four-day weekend on Friday, and today wraps it up. So this city is somnambulant, basically, except for us here at Last Week in the Church, where we are soldiering on. All right, so our focus this week is this keenly anticipated, much ballyhooed, hyper-hyped, you could say almost uber-hyped, encounter between U.S. President Joe Biden and Pope Francis. It is the fourth time, actually, that Joe Biden has encountered Pope Francis, though his first as president. He had a couple of meetings with the Pope when he was serving as vice president, and then another during a conference the Vatican sponsored in 2016, where uh, then Vice President Biden, ex-Vice President Biden, spoke about his moonshot cancer initiative and also had a chance to talk to the Pope about the loss of his son, Beau. However, this is the first time they have met since Biden moved into the White House. And of course, he is only America's second Roman Catholic commander-in-chief, and he is a deeply controversial Catholic commander-in-chief at that, because there is a significant constituency in the American Catholic Church, including a few Catholic bishops, who believe that Biden's Catholic credentials are void because of his support for abortion rights, and that not only is he therefore not in communion with the church, but he should not be receiving communion at mass. So obviously that debate hung like a cloud of subtext over this encounter. It was an extraordinarily long meeting. President Biden and the Pope were behind closed doors for 75 minutes. Normally, when a head of state comes calling, it's, you know, half hour, 40 minutes. But This one was almost double that. Now, it's understandable because this is only, this is the first time in recent memory in which a commander-in-chief in in the United States was also Catholic, so no doubt there was more to talk about. But in any event, here's what we know about what went on. And, And let me emphasize, we don't know very much. 
because the truth of it is, once those doors close in the, the library in the papal apartment, which is where the Pope receives heads of state, we have no idea. Well, there is no live feed, there is no recording. We don't know what's going on. Each side will put out statements afterwards, typically, but of course, those statements are massaged and crafted to convey a certain impression uh, of what went on. It, it's not the same thing as actually having been in the room. But with that caveat, what we know is that both sides told us that Biden and Pope Francis discussed the, the fight against poverty globally, recovery from the COVID pandemic, the fight against climate change, of course, with an eye towards the COP26 summit, in Glasgow, also the fate of migrants and refugees around the world, and also, uh, according to the White House statement, uh, armed conflict and conflict resolution. And in other words, that basic bushel basket of social justice issues that you would expect Democratic presidents in the United States and popes to discuss because they broadly see eye to eye. Now, in the past, the Vatican statement has sometimes added uh, that there was also mention of abortion or life issues. They did not do that this time. The closest you got to anything that smacked of possible conflict or tension was that the Vatican did say that there had been a discussion about freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. That, of course, has been a sore, sore point for the Catholic community in the United States, particularly with regard to the contraception mandates as part of the Obama health care reform package. But that was really it. In general, both sides were engaged in an obvious effort to put a positive face on things. Now, let's be clear, because these were issues where Biden and Francis basically already agreed, there was no dramatic outcome to this meeting. It's not like the two men emerged to announce that they had agreed on a new treaty or some dramatic new initiative. No. This was basically, I think you could say, a feel-good photo op, uh, to boil it all down. Now for the subtext. Number one, things begin on Thursday, that is the day before Biden came to the Vatican, when the Vatican that morning put out a news alert to the Vatican press corps through the usual channels, saying that there would be a live feed of the president's visit that would begin with his arrival in the courtyard inside the Apostolic Palace, and then would conclude when he went in to the papal library and the doors closed. So we would see him and Francis greeting one another outside the library, for instance. Then, a few hours later, the Vatican put out a statement saying, nope, wait, forget about it, cancel, not gonna happen, no lie. Now, obviously, for, for the press corps, uh, all was alert to the possibility of a conspiracy or mystery to unravel. This gave birth to a thousand immediate, virtually shouted questions on, you know, social media channels and messaging apps and so on, demanding to know what in the world was going on. Later in the day, the Vatican clarified that this is simply its post-COVID protocol for heads of state. They give you a video feed of the arrival in the courtyard and that's it. That leaves open the question, of course, of, well, if that's the case, why did you announce the video feed and then cancel it? And so sometime on Thursday, there was this theory that began to make the rounds that maybe the Vatican was actually secretly trying to downplay Biden's visit because they knew if it was too warm and fuzzy, some Catholics in America, including some bishops, might be upset. Now, that theory obviously died on the vine after the fact because it was clear nobody on the Vatican side was trying to play this down. If anything, they were playing it up. So, what are we left with? What we're left with is my favorite explanation for this sort of situation, which is when you're talking about why the Vatican did or didn't do something, and you've got a choice between a complex Machiavellian act of what the Italians would call forbezza, that is cleverness, or simple incompetence, you are never going to go wrong picking simple incompetence. Basically, somebody just screwed up. All right, now on the other end of the visit, another bit of subtext came 
when President Biden, after his meeting with the Pope, went on to visit Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi. And afterwards, he and Draghi were outside, took a few shouted questions from reporters. Biden was asked about the encounter with the Pope and, you know, essentially unsolicited. He volunteered the information that Pope Francis had told him he was glad that he's a good Catholic and told him to keep taking communion. Now, that, of course, has clear political relevance, not only for the Catholic constituency in the states that believes that it's an outrage that Biden takes communion, but also because the U.S. bishops later this month are going to be considering a document on the Eucharist in which there will apparently be some language about what they're calling Eucharistic coherence, that is, the conditions under which somebody ought to receive the Eucharist, which could have implications for the situation of Biden and, for that matter, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other pro-choice Catholic politicians. So saying that the Pope directly told it to keep getting communion, obviously, is a sort of fairly provocative claim in that context. Let's be clear, nobody from the Vatican has confirmed that the Pope said that, but nobody has denied it either. The position they'll take is that this was a private conversation, but by not denying it, they are clearly letting it hang out there. It would seem they're happy for that to be the impression. And so the takeaway here, and really that should be no surprise, right? Because Pope Francis has been clear from the beginning, he doesn't like communion bans. He's against what he calls weaponizing the Eucharist. He, he wants bishops to be pastors rather than politicians. So this would be utterly consistent with that line. It's just perhaps a bit, I don't know, interesting anyway, that apparently he explicitly told Biden during their conversation, green light, you're good to go. The other bit of subtext that is also mildly interesting is this. Saturday night, President Biden and his wife, Jill, went to Mass. Now, there had been a lot of speculation because, you know, he was here over a weekend, right? So there had been a lot of speculation about where and when he'd go to Mass. Would it be in the Vatican? Would he get communion from some big Vatican muckety-muck? In the end, instead, the President and the First Lady went to Mass at the Church of St. Patrick's, which is the American parish here in Rome run by the Paulist Fathers. As much as is possible when POTUS is around, it was a low-key affair. It had not been announced in advance. Only about 30 or 35 people were there for the Mass. The President and the First Lady came in and sat in the back row, then left as the Mass was ending. As much as possible, trying not to be a distraction, the President and the First Lady did receive communion. And the pastor of St. Patrick's afterwards said, well, and this is our consistent policy. We, we welcome people. We want them to be here. We're an inclusive community. And of course, we are not going to turn any, anyone away in the communion line and certainly not the president of the United States. So it went down uh, about as you would have expected. But just for those who are keeping score at home, technically, I do want to note that the Church of St. Patrick's, even though it's not Vatican property or run by the Vatican, is nevertheless located within the Vicariate of Rome. So as a technical matter, it's still the Pope's church, and the president took communion in the Pope's diocese. See if that has any impact at all on the discussion about the communion issue in the United States. Finally, before we walk away from what has been Super Bowl week, if you're an American covering the Vatican, two bits of perspective that are somewhat useful, I think, to have in mind in thinking about what happened this week. One, it is important to remember that when a president of the United States and a pope meet, it is at one level about two personalities, Joe Biden, and Jorge, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, Pope Francis, had some time, had some face time this week. And they are undeniably interesting. And the kind of kismet between the two men is undeniably interesting. They are both elderly statesmen who were kind of written off in terms of ever getting the top job, but who reached it later in life through an odd set of circumstances. 
Francis because he followed the first pope to resign voluntarily in more than 500 years. Biden because of the COVID pandemic and the phenomenon of Donald Trump. And so the, the, the intersection of these two figures on the global stage, sure, it's fascinating. But if you evaluate it just at that level, as I said, this is basically a meaningless photo op. What makes it interesting is this. This is also an institutional encounter. It's a meeting between the world's most important hard power in the United States, that is the most important military and one of the two or three most important economies in the world, and the world's most important soft power in the Vatican, the, the most important voice of conscience in global affairs. And when these two institutions intersect, on the ground and out of public view, they can do an enormous amount of good. I mean, consider, for instance, a young Nigerian woman by the name of Blessing Okaidoam. She was a victim of human trafficking at the age of 26. She was promised a job in Nigeria by a group of guys who said that they had a, a job for her in a computer store in Spain. She was a trained uh, IT person in Nigeria. When she got to Spain, there was no job, and they told her that she owed them tens of thousands of dollars for her travel and for giving her a fake visa that she couldn't use to leave on her own. They relocated her to Naples here in Italy and forced her out into the streets as a prostitute. She was rescued by a shelter for trafficking victims known as the Casa Ruth. It's run by a group of nuns in Naples, and it's, a, it's part of a network known as Talitha Kum, a network of women's religious who are involved in the fight against human trafficking, which is supported financially by the U.S. State Department, usually through grants arranged by the U.S. Embassy to the Vatican. This blessing Okaiden, in other words, is a classic example of someone whose life has been changed, literally saved, by this coalition of the hard power and the soft power trying to make change on the ground, and she is one among countless examples of that kind of thing. So if you ever wonder, what are these meetings really about? What difference do they make? The difference they make is that the people who run the Casa Ruth and countless organizations and outfits like it around the world, and the U.S. diplomats, civil servants, activists who support them, when they see the Pope and the President meeting, it is, it is a giant seal of approval on their work. It encourages them, it emboldens them, it means we'll see more of it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a consummation devoutly to be wished. Finally, on this issue of Biden and communion and whether it's appropriate for Pope Francis to be wrapping a president in a warm, loving embrace when he's got a track record on the abortion issue that is clearly at odds with church teaching. A little bit of context for you. Joe Biden is not the only head of state that Pope Francis met this weekend. Several of them, of course, were in Rome for the G20 summit. So on the same day that Francis met Biden, he also met President Moon of South Korea, and the next day, Saturday morning, he met Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India. Bear in mind that Moon in South Korea is himself a Catholic, and he just pre presided over the largest liberalization of abortion laws in South Korea in that country's history since 1953. They had a law on abortion which was among the most restrictive in the world. The highest court in South Korea recently overturned that. Six of the nine justices who did so had been uh, appointed by President Moon. And the South Korean parliament has now adopted a more permissive set of legislation in keeping with that ruling. It's a parliament in which President Moon's party has a majority. And India, of course, Modi is not Catholic. Modi is, in fact, a hardline Hindu nationalist. But nevertheless, the nation of India, too, under Modi, just presided over a significant liberalization of their abortion laws. Modi's government proposed and then had adopted the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act, which significantly expanded the ability to have legal abortions in the country of India. So think about this. 
if we were going to adopt a standard that the Pope should never engage any head of state who is pro-abortion, or at least perceived as insufficiently tough on abortion, that doesn't just rule out the United States. It rules out this weekend alone. It would have ruled out arguably the most pivotal nation in Asia after China and in India itself, and it also would have ruled out the world's second largest nation in India with a population of almost 1.4 billion people. And one could go on and on. I mean, if that were going to be your position, then the Vatican should not be dealing with about half the heads of state in Latin America, a few others in Asia, a handful in Europe, West and East, and even a, a couple in Africa. I mean, consider West Benin under President Patrice Toulon just liberalized its abortion laws. Toulon is a Catholic, goes to mass, takes communion. So, in other words, it would be a prescription for a kind of isolation. As far as the communion issue goes, too, it is probably worth noting that the Vatican has never taken the position that politicians who are Catholic, but whose political positions don't always line up with church teaching, should not receive communion. Never has been, never will be its position. And in part because it's, again, such a standard would not only exclude the occasional Democrat in the White House in the United States, but it would exclude a broad swath uh, of the world's political movers and shakers. Enough, as I put it in my column this week, to found their own Commonwealth of the Excommunicated. And for a Vatican mode of diplomacy that is premised on keeping lines of communication open and never burning bridges, that's simply never going to be their stance. That didn't start with Pope Francis, and it won't end with him. That's the context of the week to bear in mind. All right, you can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic commentary. Now, between now and next Monday, when we hook up again, I'd like to invite you to carve out a little bit of time to go on the social media platform of your choice, whatever you're rocking with these days. Give us a retweet. Give us a like. Give us a thumbs up. Write a nice review about us, for God's sake, someplace. Go forth and make disciples of all the nations. We want to get this show in front of as many eyeballs as possible because stale Catholic news is a precious thing to waste. <laughs> Until we see one another again, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.